Shalom, shalom, and welcome to this evening's Torah class. Tonight we're going to study two Torah readings. W the first one's called Matot, and that is Numbers chapter 30, verse 2 to 32, verse 42, and the second one is called Maseh, and Numbers, where is it? <laughs> Bear with me here. Numbers, chapter 33, verse 1 through chapter 36, verse 13. We may not get through all of it, but th that is information for you to study further as the week progresses in preparation for the Shabbat, which we invite you also to join us online, or if you're able to, uh, come to our shul at 10 a.m. with the Bible's Issues class, followed by our 11 a.m. main service with worship liturgy and another and more teaching. Um, let's see. Anytime during the broadcast, uh, we welcome your questions, and uh, we will get to those as best as we can. Otherwise, you can just email at asktherabbi at tzion.org. We also want to share with you that Rosh Chodesh is just a few days away where we will begin the fifth month of the biblical calendar year and uh, we'll sound the shofar and have a celebration before Yahweh celebrating, thanking him for bringing us to another time and season so that we can look forward for the upcoming holy days and feast. All right, thank you for joining us, and we're going to begin our broadcast here shortly. Please stand by.
Father, we thank you for your grace and for your word. We're here to study tonight. This is your Torah class, Lord. The words are yours. Please give us divine inspiration and words from you to help us to learn what you mean by these things. There are things that are very confusing and uh, uncertain issues about the study tonight. So I'm asking you to come and teach us. Let your spirit be here and grant us wisdom and knowledge as we study. We ask this in the name of Messiah Yeshua. And everyone says, Amen. And Father, we ask you to feed us tonight. I'm hungry, Lord. Say I'm it. I'm hungry, Lord. Feed me. Feed me. And I'm thirsty, Father. And I'm thirsty, Father. Give me living water from heaven. Give me living water from heaven. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this was kind of a little bit of a uh, uneasy start off for the class tonight because I'll be honest with you, this particular, particular <coughs> excuse me, Parsha is hard for me. Not that I don't understand it, but because I do understand it. And because of some of my life experiences and not wanting to make anybody look bad, I'm having a hard time being able to teach it. So I prayed last night. I've been reading it. I prayed last night and I said, Father, I ask you to teach this. I don't want any of this to be me because this isn't about me. It's about you. You always told Israel, you draw near me with your words, but your heart is far from me. And the same thing is true of Christianity today. Christianity has a form of godliness, but denies the power of it. What God did in Genesis chapter 2 was to establish the Sabbath day as his day of rest. Genesis chapter 2. And man comes along and says, but I don't want to keep the Sabbath, so I'm going to keep Sunday. So what is God supposed to do with it? Is he going to slap them? Well, they'd probably kill him if he did. <laughs> so, what does God do? Here he is. He's, he loves Israel. He called her and brought her out of Egypt with many signs and wonders and miracles. And then, he gives them the Sabbath day and the holy days. So when they say, oh, we want to keep the same Sabbath as the rest of the world keeps. Mm -hmm. So what, um, what are they saying? Mm -hmm. They don't want to wa worship Yahweh, the God who, who brought them out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. He redeemed them from the misery and slavery of Egypt. In exchange, he wants them to keep the holy days and the Sabbath day. Well, we don't like those holy days. And we don't like the Sabbath day. So we're going to keep the first day of the week, which would be Mithra's day of worship or... or um, other sun, other names for the sun god. Mm -hmm. So the question is, have they changed gods? Mm -hmm. If they're not honoring him, they certainly have 
haven't they? I've never taught on this chapter. I've studied it a lot, but I've never taught on it. And the reason why is because I really don't want to show, uh, make light of a previous relationship that I've had. I have on purpose avoided making any comments that would be accusatory towards uh, an ex-wife. When I married her, I intended it for it to be forever. I was married to her. But she was not married to me. She thinks she was. But when I tried to talk about some certain issues with her regarding the marriage bed and having an exclusive relationship with me. Now, don't get me wrong, she never went out and had a relationship with another man. But there's more to it than that. Our marriage agreement included a intimate relationship that we were going to have towards each other and not be um, yeah I'm going to try to put it in the, in the words of Rav Shaul, the, the Apostle Paul. He said that a, a man should not deny his wife's flesh, that they should be uh, one accord, that they should have relations together because her body is not her own. And his body is not his own. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of using my own paraphrase for what it says. Mm -hmm. I think we may just go over there and look at it. But the point is, I can't tell my wife that, I can't, that I'm not going to have relations with her. In particular, if it is going to be Something that lasts many years. Because that puts me in a position of not being able to be uh, honorable to her in my head. My body needs those things or God wouldn't have created me to be a man. So I've never taught on this because I didn't want to get into it and say things that were dishonoring to her. At the same time, it has caused me to be looked upon as dishonorable because I did not talk on those things. To this day, she still thinks she's an honorable woman. Well, she was honorable in ways, just not in the way I needed her to be. And her wedding vow was essentially a lie. I'm going to give you an exact quote that she told me, not on one occasion, but on two separate occasions. She said, I will not be your sex slave. Mm -hmm. Never asked her to be. But she was committed to be mm -hmm. by her vows to me in the marriage. 
This week's Parsha is about making vows and honoring them. I, I prayed with many tears for many nights asking God to heal her if there's something wrong with her that would not allow us to have our relations. And there was no benefit to it. And I asked Father, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to cope with this? And one day he just out and told me, divorce her. I said, but I don't believe in divorce. He said, then get you another wife. <laughs> and I said, I'm not a polygamist. Mm -hmm. He said, you're going to have to choose. That's the two options that I give you for a resolution of this kind in marriage. That's your only choice. I said, Lord, I don't want to live alone the rest of my life. What do I do? He says, I've already told you. Divorce her. I said, I really don't want to do that. Can't you fix her? <laughs> Can't you just fix her? How hard, that, how hard would that be for you to do? He says, I will not do anything like that without the person's approval. She does not want to be healed or I would have already done it. So that just really got me on the inside. And I lived with her for 35 years. Essentially in celibacy. And when I got to the point I could not stand it any longer, I once again asked him, what do you want me to do? He said, divorce her. And he says, I want you to do it as a prophetic statement. You know what a prophetic statement is? It's where God's bringing his voice into the scene through somebody else. So I said, okay, Lord, but I really, really, really don't want to have to be alone the rest of my life. And he said, before the divorce is finalized, there'll be someone there for you. Well, about six months later, I finalized the divorce with the local judge, the local court. And then the woman who is now my wife came up to me and said, has God been talking to you about me? I said, no. <laughs> well, I didn't know what, but he has in a roundabout way, okay? But she said, well, he's been talking to me about you. And my response to him was, but Lord, he's married. <laughs> She wasn't going to do anything unless it, she knew that it was God behind it. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I forget exactly how it all came about, but she said, do you think that God would permit us to have any kind of a relationship? I said, I don't know. I'll have to pray and ask him. Because I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. So I went and asked him, Lord, what do you, all, what do you want me to do about Lucifina? And the Lord said, whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, 
I've got a lot of problems here. Men are not going to understand this. But I've never been in this for men. You have to understand that what I'm doing is I'm opening up some things here that have been held very personal, very private for most of my life. It's not easy for me to do that. So I finalized the divorce, and then I went to her and I said, God told me to make our relationship whatever you want. God does not enforce anything, his will, upon other people without their desiring it. So, I told her, God told me that we can do whatever you want to do. And she said, really? <laughs> <laughs> I still didn't feel like I was really attracted <laughs> to her at that point because I wasn't looking for a woman. And I had, the thought hadn't even crossed my mind to even consider her because I'm not considering anybody. Are you following me? So, so I went ahead and uh, started seeing her and praying about what we should do each step of the way. And... My ex-wife keeps accusing her of stealing me from her. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. This is a thing that God did. And I asked the Lord, should I pay her father a um, dowry? the price for the bride. Because you see, in biblical marriages, it's not like here in America. You don't just find somebody you like and go, I think I'll marry you. That's not the way it works. But you pay the price of the bride to the father. He, she belongs to the father. But when I asked God, should I pay a, the father's uh, price, the price for the bride to the father, he said, she doesn't belong to her father. I said, well, who does she belong to? And God says, she belongs to me. And I give her to you for a wife. And I was like freaking out over this. <laughs> this isn't exactly what I thought was going to happen, you know. So I prayed and, and asked God to confirm these things. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And he confirmed it through several different sources. And so we decided to go ahead and, and uh, get married, and I went and asked her father for his permission to marry her, and she was shocked that he would do it because he was a hardcore Catholic. <laughs> but he said, okay, and he accepted me into the family. So we had a wedding ceremony out at their house out on, in the country, and she said, I've got a little, a very small family. I said, well, it can't be any smaller than mine. I've got one brother. <laughs> so we went out there for this wedding. And I'm telling you, there were, I think, something like 200 people there. Every one of them related to her. 
cousins, aunts, uncles, you know, all the way up and down on both sides of the family. And uh, I told her, I said, thought you said you had a small family. <laughs> she said, well, it is smaller than some of them. <laughs> I said, well, I think this is a very, 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 very large family. But I want you to know, God can put together a marriage like nobody I know. She is the perfect spouse for me. And she's also the perfect um, ministry partner for me. She really knows a lot by the Spirit that most people don't even have a clue about. <laughs> don't care how young or how old. I was talking to a rabbi friend of mine during all this process because I needed to get somebody with a little understanding of scripture and knowing where I'm at and where everything's at. And he's seen a lot of things that he hasn't reported to anybody. And I didn't report any of this to the congregation. Nothing. I didn't feel like I should. And that's why I've never taught on this section of Scripture, because I wanted to truly understand what God's heart is in all these things. Mm -hmm. So last night when I was reading the Scriptures again, and I said, Lord, I can't teach on this. I know it's in the Torah, and I believe it, and I agree with it. But I don't feel comfortable teaching on it. Because it's kind of putting her in a very bad light. And I did not want to do that. That's why I hadn't said anything about it until now. But I told him last night, I will do it if you will put your words in my mouth. And so all this time I've been here talking to you tonight, I have been so sensitive to try to hear Father's words. Because this isn't about me. You see... God is upset with both of his brides. Both of them. That's why we have floods all across the entire United States. Volcanoes in Hawaii. And other places are rumbling with volcanoes now. So we've got... Uh, a lot of things that are acting up and the church doesn't understand that she's at fault. She doesn't want God's laws encumbering her. And that's what God said. You draw near me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Well, I didn't feel right about even bringing this up or mentioning any of this stuff because it's not permitted unless there's a, a bet den being held on it. A bet den is a house of judgment. Well, this is not a house of judgment. God judged in the matter and told me what to do. Now, it's better to obey God than men. And there are a lot of rabbis out there that are really upset with me because the prophecy is clear that God's not going to put up with people doing their own thing instead of what he has instructed us to do. So anyway, I'm kind of caught in the middle here, and I've been caught in the middle for a very long time. 
and all I can say is it sure is nice to be loved. To have someone that really cares about you and wants to take care of you on an emotional and a sexual and a physical way. I can't tell you the relief that came to me when I married her. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. It was very good. I know there's a lot of you out there that would like to tell me off and tell me how wrong I am. I don't care what you think. I care what my father thinks. That I care deeply about. And so I am so pleased that he has chosen me to be his servant. I'm not so overly concerned now about what if I say something that she doesn't like. Well, I tried to avoid that by not teaching in this section of the Bible. I just didn't teach it. But then I was hiding that part of me from the world and it felt just didn't feel right there is so much in the Bible about divorce and putting away a spouse and instructions regarding what you may or may not do did you know that if you divorce a spouse, you're not allowed to go back together as a couple? It's in the Word. It's in the Torah. And you're supposed to give her a bill of divorcement. Why? Because when you bought your wife, and I did use the correct term there, you buy your wife, she becomes your property. And as long as she's your property, she may not see another man. Because that is adultery. And that's what Yeshua was talking about in Matthew chapter um, 19. I'll just bring it up here for you. Beginning in verse 3, it says, some Pharisees came to him to test him, and this is talking about coming to Yeshua. They ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Yeshua responded, haven't you read, he replied, that the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh so they are no longer two but one therefore what God has joined together let man not separate and then they asked did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of a divorce and send her away Yeshua replied, if Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery except for marital unfaithfulness. There's more than one way to be unfaithful in marital relations. You can deny your husband the rights that are expected of a wife, and that's unfaithfulness. And it's speaking in particular, let me bring that verse up here in the Greek. Whosoever, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away 
his wife, except to be except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery, and whoso marries her which is put away does commit adultery. Notice that this whole part in here, that whole part in there, wasn't in the original Greek. It's not in the original Greek. What does that mean? It was added in. It was added in. It's not there in the in the original text. So this is man's twist and perversion of this section here. Also, if you look at this section carefully, you'll notice that it's talking about the breaking of uh, the marriage covenant, the vows. When it talks about being unfaithful, it's talking about breaking their their um, marriage vows that they agreed upon when they married. Now, the vows are supposed to include a relationship between the man and his wife. It even said in ours, I think it said, I'll be faithful to you and no others. So that's a part of the vows that we took when we married. And I have been true to that, but because of the refusal over 35 years of marriage, was ref refused most of that time to have sexual relations with my wife. So therefore, that is a defilement or a defrauding of the contract. And therefore, I feel no uh, guilt or dishonor in having filed for divorce. It wasn't my choice. I didn't want to do that. But God instructed me to. And that was after testing her a number of times in different ways to make sure that she was really meant what she said when she said she would not be my sixth slave. That's really a bad thing to say to someone, particularly someone who is a righteous person who's trying to follow God to the best of his ability and as a leader in the community. You can't do that. That's just not permitted. So anyway, there's a lot of things going on here that, that caused me to feel at the end that it was okay um, to divorce her. Now concerning taking the second wife, that would have been an option could have been taken to make make it so that it, the situation wasn't too hard on her because I didn't want her to be without her necessities of life even though she wasn't faithful to me and mine. So I didn't want to bring her under unnecessarily pressure and obligations that she couldn't manage. So, to me it was important to try to help provide for her in some way, uh, if at all possible. And I did find some ways that I could help her out. I bought her a car. I helped her to rent an apartment for a while. So there were a lot of things that I did to try to financially help compensate for the fact that she no longer had a husband, head of the house, providing for her. And I did that purely because I wanted to be a kind and merciful prob uh, you know, person, not, not uh, being untrue to her as far as my prior obligations. I didn't just cut them off from her. 
Any questions or comments on this? I wish God had left this part of the Bible empty. Because <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> but it needed to be done. Because I know there are a lot of people out there that just don't know why I divorced her. And I wanted you to know why. And I wanted you to understand that I went through 35 years of absolutely excruciating pain in my internal parts to the point that I died in a way in my body. And it just, it literally, it just it ripped my soul to shreds. And that's one of the factors involved in my making the final decision. That's what everybody that hears this tells me, but they don't agree with me until they hear this. And so I wanted to get it out there so that people would know, and it's not a hidden matter anymore. And it was just uh, something that I had to get done. I had to do it. And I... I want Catherine to know that I didn't want to teach on this tonight. That I have avoided teaching on it for many years because I did not want to shed a bad light on you. I hope you can understand. It is prophetic. God called it prophetic, and that way it is prophetic. There's no arguing about it. And the woman in God's marriage is going to have to repent and come back to her with his heart, with her, with her whole heart, or God's not going to accept it. So there's got to come some changes, and they're going to have to come quick, because I don't think that America has long to turn. Well, I hope all of you can understand why I haven't taught on it. And why I didn't want to teach on it tonight. And why I felt it was extremely important that I did talk on it tonight. Does everybody understand? Mm -hmm. Somebody said, well, I don't like that. Well, then vote with your feet. <laughs> you know, I had to do what I had to do. And this burden is on me. And God called me a prophet. And he called me a judge. And he had me make a ruling on his bride. And I did not want to do that. That's a hard thing to even think about doing. I mean, you're God. You can do anything. But he says, no. It's against the rules for the judge to be the, the husband. A neutral person has to do that. And so he asked me to do it, and I did it. And he wanted a judge in there who could understand how he feels. And that's why he put me through all of this for the past 35 years. So that in the end, I would understand how God feels. He wants us to have a heart for him. And that's what it means to draw near him with our hearts. It makes me cry sometimes to know how God has been treated by the church and by Judaism. It's terrible. Well, let me go back over to number 30. And we'll bring it up in the complete Jewish Bible. It talks about how a woman who makes a vow, if she is married, and the day her husband feel, hears of it, if he doesn't object to it, then her vow stands. 
that there's nothing can be done about it. But in the day he hears about it, if he objects, then her uh, vow will not stand and God will not punish her for her vow if she fails to keep it. And the same thing is true if she's got a father and the same thing with uh, um, various other situations, a a daughter, a son. Gets into the laws between a man and his wife, between a father and his daughter. If she is a minor living in her father's house, so all of these things, God, God was infinitely wise in creating these laws because he knows that a woman may not be able to make a clear judgment on vows that she might make. And so he allows her a, a little escape, escape clause here through her father or her husband and... Um, that's why he put these in his rules. Okay, there's a lot of the census that was taken because they were um, instructed to do so by God. This is where they were taking ownership of some of the property before going into Canaan. Yeah, well, there was a lot of confusion going on here because people didn't really know how these rules worked. And so Moses had to straighten all that out. What did you say, dear? The yeah. This is where they broke up uh, Israel into two parts. And they gave um, part of Israel land on that side of the Jordan because they wanted a place to keep the cattle and to have homes and things like that. So he said, okay, we'll do that. Yes, but you're going to go in with Israel and fight for the taking over the land um, as a part of your payment for being able to have your inheritance a little earlier. That's my tote. That's what we just read. And then uh, ma'ase means um, stages or stops in their journey as they were traveling out of Egypt. So it talks about all the places that they went. They began the journey from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month, the morning after Pesach. The people of Israel left proudly in view of all the Egyptians. Has there ever been a mass of people who were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt had got together and left without a battle? Never. But here are the Israelis lived proudly in the face of, of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Yeah. And it tells all the stopping places as they left. And I'm not going to do much reading in this section. I may just call this good enough for tonight because I'm a little on the exhausted side, but I just felt like I had to get this covered and out of the way so everybody would know. Well, I had an interesting conversation with one of my former students.
today on the phone, someone I hadn't seen in years, and uh, he was, um, I, ha I talked to him about all of this because he hadn't heard it yet, and he has been, uh, he's been around for a long time, but he hadn't been close here so I could talk to him. But anyway, uh, when I got through, he's one of the ones that said, Rabbi, I don't know how you could do that for 35 years. <laughs> he says, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I had a couple of others that told me the same thing. So it feels good to know that some people have a God sense about them that know what's right and wrong and, and wants righteousness for everyone. Um, this section talks about the um, cities of refuge for people that had, in, had accidentally killed someone, but they, didn't, they weren't doing it by premeditation or uh, uh, in a sense of injustice, but um, gives them a city to go to where they can escape being hunted down like a, a murderer. And that's where we've gotten our prison systems for modern America. It's supposed to be a system of helping the ones that have not yet been truly convicted of a crime uh, to prevent them from being um, taken without uh, due, due process. Okay, well, that's the end of the book of uh, Numbers, and we have down here at the bottom of the chapter, Chazak, Chazak, Venit, Hazek. And it means be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Mm -hmm. And we do that at the end of every, uh, every Torah Parsha. And next week, we will begin with Deuteronomy chapter 1. Did you get anything out of the discussion tonight? Well, there you go then. I guess we had a good Torah study. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I could just see a bunch of people just saying, well, I don't want to be around here. Get out of here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have had that happen before. Mm -hmm. I just count it a wonderful honor and a privilege to be used by him as a mouthpiece. So, next Tuesday night we will begin in the book of Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. So that's it for tonight. We'll see you all next time. Here, there, or in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we want to thank you for another delight. Uh, joining us for another evening of a Torah study. Remember that we are approaching Rosh Chodesh at the beginning of the month of the fifth month um, in the biblical calendar. We will join together here at Zion uh, be just before sunset to sound the shofar and have a delightful celebration before Yahweh. And uh, we are nearing the next Moedim, that is Rosh Hashanah, the... Uh, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. So we are continually being reminded that we are coming before Yahweh and the time is near to come and celebrate his Moedim, his holy days. Uh, we also want to let you know that uh, we have a weekly Shabbat service beginning with our 10 a.m. main uh, 10 a.m. Bibles Issues class followed by our 11 a.m. main service with worship liturgy and another teaching. 
Feel free to contact us at 512-452-8700 if you have any questions, or you can just email the rabbi at asktherabbi at tzion.org. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. Shalom, shalom.